on this episode of the Wild Fed Podcast. I can't imagine being at our family's dinner table talking about something other than salmon. <laughs> it's pretty rare. Living on the boat with the family is a phenomenal experience. <laughs> We're lucky growing up doing it. Here in Maine, we have some women in our lobster fishery, but not a lot. The generation before our mom and our mom's generation is just full of incredible women breaking stereotypes, part of the fisheries, did it all, and we were able to learn from them as mentors. Just imagining the lineages of people who relied on salmon on that coastline, like you can't really remove it and have life there on that coast in the same way, right? It is this life-giving food that you start to feel your skin get all soft and your hair silky and helping you get through the day and the hard work on the boat. We are just a pinprick in this time where you gotta leave it a little better than we were given it. Episode 51 of the Wild Fed Podcast, Made of Salmon. The Salmon Sisters of Alaska with Emma Lakaitis and Claire Nathan is brought to you by Sir Thrival. Sir Thrival's chaga and reishi mushrooms are two of my favorite immune system modulating and antiviral supplements. Sir Thrival makes a dual extract of each, starting with wild and wood-grown mushrooms, then extracting them in both alcohol and hot water and packing them in muron violet glass, which keeps visible light out for an incredible shelf life. Unlike my cilial biomass products, this dual extract is full spectrum, functioning both as an adaptogen and as an immune system support. Right now, through October 15th, the coupon code DEFEND15 gets you 15% off chaga and reishi extracts at surthrival.com. This episode is also brought to you by Earthrunners. Earthrunners are modern adventure sandals based on the ancestral human footwear design known as Hurachis. If you've ever read Born to Run, you'll remember the stories of the Tarahumara, the indigenous group living in Mexico, whose tribal name translates to those who run fast. They're known for long-distance endurance runs, up to an incredible 200 miles in a single session, and they do it all in Hirachi sandals. In fact, it was the study of these folks that spurred the modern barefoot running movement. Now you can get your own Hirachis upgraded with modern materials, including Vibram soles and cutting-edge earthing technology. Every pair of Earthrunners uses a copper plug in the sole and electrically conductive laces that keep you, like the rest of the planet's animal kingdom, electrically grounded. Stay connected to your ancestry. Stay connected to the Earth. Get grounded with Earthrunners. Go to earthrunners.com to learn more and use the coupon code WILDFED for 10% off your order. Hey, one last thing. Our WILDFED hat sale ends on Thursday, October the 15th. We've got premium snapback trucker hats in field green and blaze orange. Head over to wild-fed.com and use the coupon code HAT25 to get 25% off any hat in the store. I'm Daniel Vitalis, and you're listening to The Wild Fed Podcast, a show about reconnecting with nature through hunting, fishing, foraging, and food. Wild Fed. Food is all around you. Today's show is with Emma Lakaitis and Claire Nathan, aka the Salmon Sisters. These incredible ladies are merging commercial salmon fishing, fashion, and food in a really beautiful and modern way. Not only do they spend their commercial fishing season in Alaska harvesting salmon, halibut, and Pacific cod, but they run a beautiful women's clothing line specializing in ocean-inspired graphics on tops, bottoms, and even a really cool collaboration with Extra Tough Boots. If you aren't familiar, Extra Toughs are the Alaskan commercial fisherman's boot of choice, but they aren't exactly the most attractive boots to look at. The Salmon Sisters have changed that, so if you're looking for some ladies' boots for time spent in the outdoors or on the water, check those out. But they've also written an excellent cookbook called The Salmon Sisters, Feasting, Fishing, and Living in Alaska, featuring recipes from their childhood homestead and their many years of commercial salmon fishing. What really drew me to them was the way they talk about wild foods, the salmon themselves, and the way that fisheries can create connections to place. I really resonate with the message they're sharing and the way they're communicating it. These women are, in my opinion at least, total iconoclasts. Nothing about what they're doing or how they're doing it fits the mold. They, like so many of you listening, 
are part of this newly emerging narrative about how humans and nature can be harmonized and about how the food we eat and the way we obtain it is one of the most critical parts of that equation. So check this interview out and then head over to their website, aksalmonsisters.com, where you can find wild-caught Alaskan fish, frozen and ready to ship, as well as some great clothing too. I find the work ethic of these incredible women extremely inspiring and their gentle messaging about nature and our place in it very uplifting too. So long live the Salmon Sisters. And of course, all five species of Pacific Salmon too. Emma and Claire, welcome to the show. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you for having me, Daniel. Yeah, I'm really excited. You know, I just recently learned about you guys uh, in an Epoch Times article, a little feature on you, and um, I was like, oh, I have to talk to them. So I've, I've <laughs> now, uh, I've had the chance to look over your book. I haven't had the chance to read it fully as I just got it, but um, just congratulations on a really beautiful and unique, uh, a unique book you put together. Mm, thank you. Yeah, it's been a really cool thing to see out in the world. Those things take a long time to put together. So <laughs> it seems like we've been thinking about it, living with it with a, for a long time, but it's really fun to share it with our community and get people cooking right now seems like yeah we'll yeah. have some time at home <laughs> one of the things i love about your story is that there's like some heritage to it but i would like to start in the present and talk about who you both are today and what you're doing and what your project or it seems like many projects from what i can tell uh so maybe we could start at at now and then we'll work our way back a little bit and then maybe we can kind of finish you know moving into the future but tell us a little bit about Sam and Sisters who you are and uh and what you're doing and and just for the listener um Emma you are in Washington state right now and Claire you're in Alaska right now yeah um that's right <laughs> we move around quite a bit um we spend our summers in Alaska commercial fishing so um we've both been on the water since May and we are just kind of getting settled back into our land lives. But yeah, I guess to give you, to just start us off, we are sisters. Um, we grew up in Alaska and, and this is we, Emma speaking, right? For yeah, the this is Emma. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, we have a company called Salmon Sisters and we've had it for about, now I lose track, but maybe seven years now. Um, we started off as a screen print apparel company and we were making a lot of t-shirts and hoodies and gear for women who commercial fish and um, clothing that represented what we do on the water. And our business has kind of grown into, it, it's still that and it's also other things. So now we um, are really proud to offer a lot of the wild fish that Alaskans catch and um, we have our cookbook, which is really exciting, and we've been kind of gearing gearing more towards food and just sharing all the wilds of Alaska with people and um, really just excited to share our uh, livelihood on the water and connect people to that. Uh, uh, currently, I am out in Dutch Harbor on the Aleutian Islands, and Emma just left me here about a week ago um, to head home for the winter, but we... Yeah, I'm gonna put it perfectly. We started a company off of just like the pride of our work and place, um, especially like growing up in the Aleutians and fishing here. And then it just transpired into like what our community and customers needed at the time. So right now, Sam and Sisters is solely focused on getting people wild Alaska seafood. Um, we, with our launch of our cookbook in April, saw this incredible demand of people working with food, connecting to their place um, and connecting to their families at home. And we were so fortunate. Our book came out at that time. We were able to help people off a little comfort and inspiration through that. And then we were lucky too. Um, we were just about to start our salmon season and we were, we've were we been able to start filling quite a few of our like Wild Alaska salmon orders to customers this late summer and fall. Um, and so, yeah, we are at a place, place of rest. Like we just finally were able to finish our busy season. And this is the time where we get to dig back into our small business salmon sisters. And it's really nice to talk to you this time, like with reflection and yeah, just coming off a pretty busy, crazy season on the water. Um, 
thankful for everything it gave us. Tell us a little bit about the kind of fishing that you do, what species you're after. And, uh, you know, I'm on the East Coast in Maine. And so your fisheries out there are so exotic to me. You know, our salmon fishery is is essentially gone and, and has been for some time. And, you know, Atlantic salmon's on the endangered species list here. And, uh, we, you know, we, we don't really have an intact salmon fishery. We have a ground fishery. Um, for some related species that you guys fish, but I'd love to hear about the fishery. How, you know, what species you're catching, how is your season? Um, what are the fishing methods you use? Things like that. Well, we are very lucky in Alaska. (laughs) The salmon runs are still strong and, um, we pretty much spend the whole summer chasing them around. So, um, we, let's see, our family works on the water together. Um, Claire and I are on different boats in the summer these days, and I have been out in Western Alaska salmon seining with my dad and our crew. Um, and so basically we are using our 58 foot boat and a smaller skiff and a net, and we are, um, catching, well, we're targeting sockeye and pink salmon and, um, later season there's some coho and chums and we're getting um yeah fish (laughs) harvesting fish that way in the earlier season we are on a smaller boat um, in the copper river delta and we're catching beautiful red salmon king salmon and Mm -hmm. later season coho um so we are kind of in a seasonal transition between places um, just kind of following the fish and Claire is on a tender with her husband, Peter, and they are the, basically the fishing fleet is out catching the fish all day. And then they are delivering salmon to Claire's boat and then Claire's boat takes it back to shore to be processed. So, um, that's kind of our, a quick look at the salmon harvesting, um, in the fall, our family, catches halibut and we've Mm. done this for pretty much every fall since we were old enough to work on the boat (laughs) are you are you long lining for them how how are you catching them yeah we're long lining for halibut and so we're on our our smaller boat and the whole family gets on board and it's kind of just family as crew and we go out towards um western alaska so around dutch harbor and um, we spend about a month or so on the boat, depending on how long it kind of takes us to wow. catch our fish. And yeah, so we're on the boat doing that. And then in the winter time, our family's boat. Obviously not, a, not a month on the boat straight, right? I mean, are you're, you're back and forth. Yeah. Well, actually we're pretty much living on the boat, like from May wow. until October. <laughs> we do go in, <laughs> yeah. we do go in to deliver the fish. Um, when we're halibut fishing, but it's usually just a day in port and you get you know, a night, you get a night yeah. in bed before you turn around. Yeah. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sometimes an afternoon. Yeah. So where I am right now, our family's boats, the two of them are right here today. They're working on transitioning. They're delivering their last load of halibut um, for the year. And then they start fishing for black cod or sable fish. So they have about a month of that. And then they transition back in the new year to fishing for Pacific cod um, with pots. So the family's boats are going year round and Emma and I participate in the summer. As she said, like we do a lot of the I don't know, like the onshore support too, like a lot of the shipyards and um, living on the boat with the family is a phenomenal experience. <laughs> We're lucky growing up doing it. We're pretty well like trained, excellent communication, uh, personal space, like working together, playing together. We're good <laughs> at it. Um, but yeah, we the last couple of years we have been in separate places, especially during the salmon season. And we ha- are able to communicate by in reach. So you receive these little texts, updates of like catches. Oh, and- man. Are you good at running that in reach? Because man, I, I find, <laughs> I find <laughs> I, my, my relationship with Garmin, I would say it's like, uh, awesome hardware, really tough software to navigate, you yeah. know, like I love the actual piece of equipment, but then trying to run it, I get so, I get so discouraged. I mean, I must have 15 different GPSs and in reaches and dog yeah. collars and man, they're hard to use. <laughs> I would say, I think it's a hard, 
let's just say long distance is hard on an in reach. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it is a nice nice to have some way to reach your loved ones when in need. <laughs> I think the, what we get wound up in is like each boat has one and each crewman or captain and just like the accidental texts that go back and forth about like catch or, <laughs> or like ah shoot too many people on here but no we're lucky it's we've never had that before until about a year or two ago and it's it's been a game changer tell me about the uh i i'm over on when i found your website because i um i love apparel companies especially that speak to um out the outdoors and and even more so you know relate to like wild foods in the outdoors and so I'm going through the, the, and I'm like, oh, I love all these designs, but there's nothing for dudes, right? It's like a very female focused <laughs> company. Yeah. And I kind of stepped back from that. And I was like, man, this is really cool. Because I think when people um, imagine commercial fisheries, it's not something you really think a lot about. I mean, I know here in Maine that we have, you know, some, some women in our lobster fishery, but not a lot, you know, uh, it's like a small cadre of women who are part of it. Uh, but I see that changing and growing really fast. Like it's been changing over really fast. And uh, so I'm curious about that, that focus on uh, women in the fisheries. Um, and uh, it seems like your team is, is largely comprised of women too. So just want to give you some space to talk a little bit about that and uh, the sort of the role of women today in commercial fisheries. We are very fortunate. Um, we're only second generation. Like our parents came up to Alaska when they were in their early 20s um, and started commercial fishing. But the generation before our mom and our mom's generation is just full of incredible women that led a pretty easy path for like Emma and I's age group, this generation, and we hope to do the same. Um, there's so many women fishing with their families and then also part of our um, peer group, so many women taking on their families' businesses or starting their own, especially in Alaska's salmon fisheries. Like a lot have pretty sm small operations, like a single person or one or two crew and are seasonal and have allowed them to supplement like their fishing lifestyle with teaching or nursing or with another career to make it a little bit more feasible to enter the fishery. Um, but yeah, I guess to back up, we're very fortunate that we are coming from a very, very, very strong foundation of women who did a lot of the really challenging, like breaking stereotypes, part of the fisheries, like did it all. And we were able to learn from them as mentors and have a little bit, um, of an easier ride into it. And yeah, a lot of women are like have operations in like Bristol Bay or like the Copper River, Prince William Sound, like gill netting for salmon. And there's also quite a few incredible captains running sane vessels like in Prince William Sound in Southeast Alaska. Um, and yeah, we fish like long line as well. There's a lot of women crewing and doing all types of like, uh, I'd say every fishery across the board in Alaska from like trawling for Pollock to um, like trolling for Kings in Southeast. It's pretty incredible. And then also like the shoreside operation of like, between management, between processing and between like all types of like the smallest um, jobs to like decisions about our fisheries that are women involved currently. Yeah. And I think, you know, in Alaska, a lot of, a lot of girls grew up in fishing families and it, it's a great summer job. It's also a really great way to pay for college, which is what, you know, what we were doing when we were a little bit younger. So it's, you know, it's really physical work, but it's also, it's, you're outside and it's great. It's like maybe like being a, I don't know, mowing lawns or being a lifeguard. <laughs> you're just out there. <laughs> uh, it's a little, maybe yeah. slight, slightly <laughs> riskier, a little, little more weathering. But yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, but I think you get, you know, growing up with yeah. it, you get used to it. And yeah. um, some, some people choose to keep doing it and take it on as their full-time profession. Um, and it's just really, I think it's just been really fun for us to see, like the women in our industry um, just become more connected and visible and just to have Sam and sisters to celebrate them. <laughs> uh, I, I think it's just been really cool to see fishermen. And also, you know, we have in Alaska, we are fisheries are 
um, involves so many different people. We have people at, um, you know, like the fisheries biologists, observers on boats, everyone's, you know, you see them out wearing salmon sisters gear and that's really, really fun to just have, you know, have something that's very specific to their work and work on the water to wear. And, um, yeah, it's, it's been really fun to find people through it too, and just feel more connected to our community of women and, um, yeah, just get, and also just get ladies who are, um, in Alaska and outside Alaska, um, all, you know, connected to salmon and, and the water and the places where they can go explore and wear our gear. And, um, yeah, it's awesome. It's pretty fun. There's, I want to talk to you guys, um, in a bit about salmon themselves and sort of what they mean to you, I guess, totemically or iconically, um, you know, and I want to talk also about sort of how you see commercial fisheries and sort of their importance to people. But I want to set the stage a little bit more too. Your book is called "The Salmon Sisters: Feasting, Fishing, and Living in Alaska," and it's. I always have heard that it's difficult to get a seafood cookbook published. Like I, I, I hear that compared to other cookbooks a lot. So, one of the things I wanted to ask you about was sort of getting published, uh, but also I wanted to ask about the all the stuff that's in the book that isn't just recipes because you have, I think there's 50 recipes in the book, but there's a lot of other really cool stuff in there. There's sort of some like little diagrams and breakdowns on the different fishing techniques and equipment that you use. There's some stuff on knots and stuff on filleting fish and just like lots of little cool sort of tabletop stuff to read about. Um, and I was hoping that maybe you guys could sort of describe, I know the, the listener can't see it, but maybe describe some of these fishing techniques you're talking about. So people, when you say trolling or you say seining, so that people know what you mean. And then also I'd love to describe um, some of these fish. Maybe we could talk a little bit about sort of how you rank these salmon for food quality and, and uh, how the market sees them and also some of these other species too. But maybe we could talk a little bit about some of these fishing techniques and what they mean so that the listener is sort of up to speed. Uh, I think a lot of us who are into wild foods are, are anglers. Um, but not, you know, don't have experience with commercial fisheries so much. So two of the main, or let's start with one, one of the main ways we catch salmon in Alaska is through gill netting. And, um, so basically you are living on a little boat, usually like around 38, 40 feet long. Um, it's typical that you would have a captain and a couple crew, maybe two crew, um, two or three crew. Um, you're living on the boat all summer and you are targeting um, sockeye salmon and coho salmon and sometimes king salmon. The net that you're using is, um, let's see, it flo- so you have a reel on the back of your boat, like um, basically like a big, <laughs> I'm such a visual person, it's hard to describe. <laughs> <laughs> um, you have a reel on the back of the boat where the, the net is wa- can is wound around it. And but so it's bigger than a bread box. <laughs> it's bigger than that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Basically, you can set the net out behind your boat, um, and there's a it's a floating net. There's corks on the top, and there's web hanging from the corks and on the bottom. There's a lead line, so it's kind of like hanging like a big wall in the water, um, and when you're on one of these drift boats, basically the, um, you can kind of let the net go. You can either let it go. It's drifting with the current. Um, you're there next to it, tending the net. You can, um, keep shape with it by pulling maybe one end of the net, um, you know, into the current or along the shore or however you're, however the fish are swimming, you're kind of trying to put this wall in front of them. So they're swimming. This wall is a big rectangular net, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. And so the fish are swimming, they're just swimming along and they, the way the net catches them is they go headfirst into the net and, um, there, it kind of catches them. And so when you're, then you're pulling the net in back onto the reel on the, onto your boat and you're picking each fish out individually. Um, and so, yeah. And then, so your and net get, comes they get, they get in on. there about, they get into that net about up to their like gill plates and then get kind of yeah. get caught up in that. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Because then they get a little bit wider when they get towards the middle of the fish. So that's usually you're picking them out, like their heads are stuck in there and you're just picking them out like that. And then they carefully get put onto ice and then into your fish hold. And then they are delivered later um, 
at the end of the day to a tender. And what else is cool about gill netting? Yeah, it's just a yeah, nice lifestyle. Yeah. <laughs> or tis- <laughs> Yeah. with beautiful fish um mm-hmm. and just like the care and attention and just you're like right on the water and the proximity to like all things natural and incredible yeah you're just there you're bobbing around in the middle of ever yeah <laughs> with this movement towards like um fish that have been cared for a little bit better on their way to market is gill netting uh, compared to seining let's say are those fish in better shape when they get onto the boat um or go into the hold uh, or like sort of where would you rank gill netting as far as like the impact on the qu- final quality of the fish i guess mm-hmm. well i'd say the majority of the gill net quality is due to just the close time of like catch to processor to customer in a lot of ways okay or just like yeah. that like incredible like that supply chain um like fish coming aboard with both methods i would say are equally ranked in like like quality and care coming on deck and like they're going into ice or refrigerated seawater immediately and like here's your beautiful food and like it, like people are taking such excellent care knowing that is happening but then just like the transition time between like a lot of gill netters are able to like or trollers are able to like pressure bleed their fish or have this incredible like blood out perfectly like head and gutted going to market like that direct connection maybe to um like a chef or like a csa where maybe some of the larger like sane operations are in such remote parts of the state like those logistic uh, yep. things yeah got it and just those that in like balance of gill netting you might have like a more set schedule administered by Alaska Department of Fish and Game where you could seasonally run that like direct marketing or have that like onshore operation time to get your catch to like that end customer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Smaller quantity, excellent care overall. Yeah. And saving um Emma in this operation fishes with our family and drives the skiff. So you have the larger 58 foot boat and you have the net stacked on the back. And then the, like when you're about to make a set, you like you, the captain yells, go <laughs> and you, the skiff Emma <laughs> jumps, um, starts like holds its place. And then the boat drives away from it in a semicircle and pulls the net out. And there you're thinking like, kind of like a coin purse. Like you have this bag that has like a purse line at the bottom. So you hold it and the fish, like a school of fish would swim into it. And then you would slowly at your time allotment would circle up and then you would slowly like purse up the bottom of this net and the fish Mm -hmm. would remain in like a school. And then um, you would slowly haul the net back on board where you end up with the catch, like in a very small segment of this net next to the boat. And then using hydraulics, you'll roll it onto the back deck of the boat directly into the hold of refrigerated seawater. So you have like very live fish. It goes direct right in. Right in. And then- Oh, um, wow. Yeah, and Emma, as Emma said, and like so. There's no, doing. there's not like a bycatch. You don't have to sort those fish first. They can go right into the hold. There's no like bycatch right. or anything like that. Yeah, I think Emma, you may have seen maybe once a flounder or something or a different. <laughs> no <laughs> way! <laughs> wow. Maybe, maybe some but, kelp. Sometimes yeah, kelp. <laughs> in that mid, like top to mid water level, where like in wow. Cap- see the big schools of um, salmon swimming in Emma from the skiff can see them. Um, And then once like at the end of the day, when you approach the tender to offload your catch, like that is where you would sort out the different species of salmon and weigh and be like your fish ticket would a lot. So that's where kind of the hand, the handling happens. So like X amount of pink salmon, like probably maybe two sockeye salmon. Um, so you're looking at every fish and touching them as they um, are put onto the tender. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, yeah and the crew the- on the boat, instead of picking fish out of the gill net on a seiner, the crew is mostly responsible for stacking the net. That's really like the main job. So okay. the guys on the back deck are just all day. I mean, sometimes we'll make up, to, you know, 20 sets would be a lot, but we're just doing the same thing over and over again. They're stacking that net on, on the back of the deck 
20 times. <laughs> so it's a lot of just, yeah, a lot of work with your full body and um, it's a huge net. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Making perfect like, piles that get to fit on the back of the boat. Yeah. And like with Alaska's like fisheries, we have like, like the fishermen, like con- constantly are thinking of yourself as like a a provider of like this incredible superfood for people. Like this is this is food I am catching. Like I am able to provide this to people to feed their families, feed themselves, and then sort of the other dimension is this like responsible stewards or like stewardship of this like natural resource and being able to like f- see like like days where we are standing down or when we're not tech, like the openers aren't happening, which are regulated by Alaska department of fish and game um, to put aside that short-term opportunity of catch for like the long-term model of sustainability for Alaska. So Alaska has like that mandate of like the sustainable seafood is written into the state's constitution. Um, so you have the number one priority is to reach like salmon escapement yearly um, and Alaska Department of Fish and Game and all of their tech. And they have folks on tenders, on rivers, uh, like everywhere in office, like daily monitoring what's heading up streams um, and like scale count, everything what's happening um, to be able to like daily and quickly monitor like when commercial fishermen are able to have an opportunity to harvest. When I started interviewing folks about commercial fisheries a few years back, it's, it's really interesting, like what goes on in commercial fisheries and then how the public perceives it. Sometimes Mm -hmm. if you just read or watched media, you might walk away with this impression that like these are like almost unregulated activities that are happening where there's just this yeah. like constant take and and i think people don't realize sometimes like how much this is actually overseen and uh how it's it's both biology so you have the science piece and then you have the legislative and regulatory piece um mm-hmm. and i want to know a little bit about you know and i think there's there's a lot of complexity there because it's like an individual angling is so different than a commercial fishery. Uh, however, it's funny with the with the commercial fishery. I think sometimes like the people get worried about overfishing, and I often want to remind people: it's like, hey, it's, <laughs> first of all, who's this buying these fish? You know, first of all, it's like the people who are eating the fish in place in times and places where there's been overfishing. It's like not the fishermen as much as it's the people who are paying for it. But but then here in the United States, I think we just have this amazing conservation system and not everybody understands that. So I'm wondering a little bit about when you guys growing up, what the fishery was like and what the regulatory system was like, and then how you've seen that change over the years, both with the runs of fish themselves and then also with the regulation and then kind of where it's at now. Uh, Because I'd love to paint a picture for people of how this is overseen, uh, lest anybody who's out there who hears, you know, stories about salmon decline and things like that, lest they think that there's this sort of, um, you know, kind of excessive take that's happening. We'll get right back to the show in a moment. But first, Wild Fed is proud to be sponsored by Red Kill Mountain Homestead Farms. Red Kill Mountain delivers real wild apples direct to your door. Red Kill Mountain is home to an incredible wild apple savanna where thousands of unique, one-of-a-kind apple trees dot the southern hillside, growing incredible fruit that's never been grafted, sprayed, or even irrigated. Think about this. Apples, which usually contain five seeds, never breed true. In other words, if you had an apple tree with 100 apples on it and every seed from every apple were to become a seedling, or what we call a pippin, we'd get 500 different trees. Each would produce a different apple. Big Apple hates that because it makes it impossible to predict the flavor and texture of apples grown from seed. The reason you can get consistent apple varieties in stores and orchards is because the apple industry relies on cloned apples from grafting. That's right, every apple you ever bought in a store or picked in an orchard was a clone. You know, Johnny Appleseed believed that it violated God's natural law to clone apples. And that's why he was renowned for selling pippins, or apple trees grown from seed. In that same tradition, every apple coming from Red Kill Mountain is from a unique pippin, grown by nature from seed. These are pure, 
wild fruits. Red Kill delivers these apples direct to your door in two ways, as a wild apple box and a wild apple cleanse. The wild apple box holds about two pounds of unique, hand-picked wild apples, and the wild apple cleanse contains about three pounds of hand-picked wild apples. If you've never tried real apples, apples as nature intended, you owe it to yourself to give them a try. Go over to redkillmountainhomesteadfarms.com and order yourself a box of wild apples. The coupon code WILDFED20 gets you 20% off, and you'll be supporting this incredible wild apple savanna and the folks who steward it. Again, it's redkillmountainhomesteadfarms.com, and the coupon code is WILDFED20 for 20% off. Now, back to the show. So you have both state and federal management of fisheries that are happening in Alaska and on the West Coast. Um, And as you said, the intricacies you could write a thousand page book on all the different regulations, both science and then management wise, um, those different resources working together to have the most, the best plan for future generation success and sustainability of these um, different species. So like the Alaska model, like the number one priority is for the future generations to have this opportunity to commercial fish and feed the world with this incredible protein. Um, so I think what we've seen in our um, short 20 years as commercial fishermen in Alaska is like different opportunity, um, like working through different gear types um, and just like the different regulations of those gear types and how they work together in the areas of different areas of Alaska. And then just trying to understand that there's so many people at play, so many different types of gear types, so many different areas of Alaska and how they interplay with each other. Like salmon are moving. They are heading across to their home stream and just like the interplay and knowledge that needs to be shared between different fisheries groups and different areas of the state um, to have the absolute best like data available to make the decisions at hand and like Alaska like facing it's like warming waters different like ocean acidification like we we are targeting like wild species that are moving and transitioning and adapting to climate change and different like like different user groups targeting them and all things um so yeah, I would say, sorry, I'm going off on a tangent here, but what we Please, have- t- is Tangents like, welcome. <laughs> in our lifetime, um, it's, it's funny, like thinking about our lifetime is like 20 years on a boat is so short in the grand scheme of things. Like we are just a tiny, tiny like pinprick in this whole, like just in the next hundred years or 200 years of fisheries mm-hmm. in Alaska. And I think what what the biggest advantage we've seen is just increased like science and fishermen helping that scientific like capture on the grounds, like between like observers on boats, um, like fishermen taking like scale samples. Fishing game puts observers on, on your boats, you're saying? Yeah, different regulatory agencies puts has observers on boats who are constantly collecting data. Um, And then just different, like everything from like weather buoys to like tagging systems to just like a much better understanding of like where things are moving, what things are doing, different Mm -hmm. surveys, um, etc. And that has drastically increased over the last, um, our lifetime with just like funding due to those projects. Um, You know, out here, Claire, we have this lobster fishery and the fishermen and the biologists are working together really closely. And And there's this really amicable thing going on where the fishermen believe that the regulatory system is working in their favor. But then if you look at our cod fishery, which is pretty much collapsed now, and this kind of extends from here up to Newfoundland, there's this sense that the the fishermen have that the regulators have tried to force them out of something that still could be good. And there's this contention there. So I've seen these, I've seen these two things where you have like commercial fisheries where the, the fishermen and the biologists are sort of at odds with each other. And then I've seen these other commercial fisheries where they feel like it feels like they're working together in this really beautiful, harmonious way. What's the tone and tenor out there? It sounds like this is very cooperative. Um, is that the general sense in the salmon fishery? 
Yeah, absolutely. Cooperative with the same like regulatory fisherman biology aspect. And then also we've seen an uptick in like cooperation between user groups around the state in the commercial sector and also between user groups of like personal use, subsistence, commercial, recreational, like that. And I think a lot like Alaska is an interesting state due to you have so much like remote coastline and a lot of like coastal fishing activity that might be centered around commercial where the larger part of the population of Alaska lives around like the Anchorage Kenai Peninsula um, Valley area where um, just like that increased amount of human traffic has led to more like um interest in those particular like salmon runs around the area that are easily accessible and i think this is the first like opera like thing we have seen in emma and i's lifetime of just like increased competition i guess for that one resource and it will be interesting to see how all parties can work together and science can lead us forward one of the things that comes across when i read your book is this real passion for food uh, also, it seems like the second half of the of the recipes are are a lot of like stuff that you grew up with, not just seafood recipes, but sort of like homestead recipes. And there's this communication about passion for food. And so I want to hear a little bit about the food component for you, what it means to be harvesting food that you know is going to be eaten by the people, what how you feel about salmon themselves as a food. Just you kind of were talking about it being this beautiful protein. I'm just curious, like how you feel about that whole component, you know, looking at it outside of the fisheries part and looking at it from the culinary side. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think salmon makes it pretty easy for us to just love all, all parts of it. I mean, it's kind of, I think as you, you mentioned before, some, you said the word totemic <laughs> and I think that would aptly describe salmon to us in our lives. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's been, the the animal and the thing that has sustained our family in so many ways whether it's through our work um through our food through just i mean like through connection to the place where we live and to alaska and our community of fishermen um i think as far as food goes i i mean there's nothing more delicious to us i think you know it's funny because we eat it pretty much every day when we're fishing <laughs> and somehow I mean yeah I, I can't really think of day you know it's like this summer I was I remember having a conversation with like the crew on our boat and I I do some of the cooking and we kind of share the responsibility but we all kind of had a little huddle one day and we we're like are we eating too much fish are we sick of it no <laughs> let's eat it for breakfast <laughs> I think it's just it's so I mean it's straight straight from the ocean and it is fresh and it is just kind of this um life-giving food that feels like it's you know like you're you start to feel your skin get all soft and your hair silky and that like oh, salmon yeah. oil in your you know everywhere just like helping you get through the day and the hard work on the boat and I, I think it just you know it makes you feel good it makes us feel super strong and healthy and um we're really lucky to be so close to the source but I think in our lives, we've, it's also been, you know, our family's tradition and the way that we spend time together. So, you know, we work on the boat, like grew up working on the boat with our parents and we grew up smoking salmon with our mom and she would set a little net out in front of our house and get a few to just stick in her smoke every day. And that tradition is, you know, that as well as canning and jarring fish and, putting it up for winter in our freezer sort of like this seasonal routine that we all do together and then have this delicious food to enjoy in the winter and you know that's what we've been trying to provide our customers through our business and um are really excited to be able to share that it's just like the most incredible food most tasty and so good for you and um yeah the recipes in our book you know a lot of them focus on salmon and these are all recipes that we, I guess our mom kind of grew up cooking. She's an amazing cook and she has this big, she had this big binder of, you know, recipes. A lot of, you know, I don't, 
she doesn't really cook from recipes, but we kind of, she helped us write them all down and collect them for our book. But, um, you know, salmon's so delicious on its own. It's really all it needs is a little bit of salt and maybe a drizzle of olive oil or, you know, whatever you have on hand. Um, it's probably the easiest food we know to cook. So a lot of that, you know, the idea behind that is hopefully trying to get that across in the book is that you don't really need to do much if you have beautiful wild ingredients. And um, yeah, it's just the food that's really connected us to our home and yeah, the people around us too. The connection to people and place and community and all the things, but also like another level layer of like salmon need people to champion them, like to protect their habitat and have like a clear way home um, and to let them do like everything incredible they're doing upstream for our ecosystems as well. Um, and that's something that like we just hope when people are able to like engross the, like our stories and how like, we're able to participate in this and we're so fortunate that generations before us has allowed us to that like they can take a tiny piece away and just champion the resource champion the salmon and keep their habitat healthy and safe um, because it's all all we can provide for them like we're very lucky that we are able to enjoy like everything they create and like how can we give back and that's just like we have to keep them safe and ocean clean mm -hmm. yeah and i think the way that we try to communicate that is just through you know like one of the easiest way to understand that is through your food because then you have that direct connection to where you know, like, where does it come from? What does it need? And even if you live far away from salmon habitat, you know, it's like, it's something that you can grasp in your mind. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, it, yeah, I think that's just, you know, we are, we all need to eat. And um, if we're paying attention to where our food comes from, that can really connect us back to these bigger ideas of like, what our, you know, what, what our food needs. And if that's wild food like salmon, what does that need? And, you know, how can I support it and, um, yeah, keep it healthy so I can keep eating it basically. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, well, a couple things I want to say. I, I'm interested to imagine Alaska over the last, you know, I don't know, 15,000 years. Uh, yeah. let's say the first sort of people who crossed over the Bering land straight. And I want to say everything I'm about to say, like, well, let's like completely remove all of the racial politics and tribal politics and colonial politics and all that stuff because it, it it's obviously extremely important but it also makes it hard to tell the story the way i want to kind of put it out there it's like just imagining the lineages of people who've relied on salmon on that coastline for the last fifteen thousand years and how they've changed you know from the people who first came over to the tribes that were there later to eventually there being sort of Europeans over there and just, and Russians and, and just the idea of like, you guys said, you know, 20 years is not that long. And it's not when you look at 15,000 years, I'd say 20 years is enough time to develop mastery, but it's neat to sort of see that, like you said, totemically over time that this fish has become, is the sort of means of survival on that coastline in a way, I guess, like you can't really ex like, remove it and have really a life there on that coast in the same way right and there's this part of your book you have a a, a section with the header it says made of salmon and that really grabbed me because we say at wildfed a lot we talk about being made of place and we encourage people to be at least in part made out of the place where they live because i think about people who live um in any one place let's say you live in in la or you live in manhattan and your body is made out of foods from just like everywhere but where you are you know mm -hmm. foods from the most far-flung places and your body even the water a lot of people are drinking is coming from far away and so it's like your blood your tissues aren't made out of the place where you are and then in alaska you know you have this thing where it's not just made of place but made out of the salmon that are there all the time. And that's true for those first people that cross. That's true for the indigenous people that live there. It's true for all the people like living there today who are eating salmon. I just think this is really fascinating that this animal is so totemic. So talk to me about sort of being made of salmon. Like, like, can you even really see yourself separate from salmon in a way? Does that make sense? It's like hard to almost pick apart where you end and salmon begin if you're eating it that much. Is that making sense? What yeah. I'm trying to say? Yeah, like salmon 
dictates everything in our work and per like all life like just being able to also like be a human today in 2020 and have a little bit of your world revolve around like seasonal or like salmon dictates that flow of like harvest and coming back and spawning right. and just knowing and like connecting to that is we're so fortunate like there's something bigger that we're able to tap into there um but i'll let emma talk a little bit but just yeah it's incredible to still have that connection of like this this is you're so lucky to be part of it yeah i like i re yeah really thinking about that i can't imagine a life without sam and i think like personally the way that our lives have kind of designed themselves have been around the salmon life cycle and so imagining something other than that um is is hard <laughs> i think the way our family has built itself has been around salmon our traditions the way we share with our friends and family um it's all like a lot of that is food and a lot of that's food in the form of salmon it's the way we you know share our love and it's the way we connect with other people it's where community connects with other people and in alaska i think a lot of right exactly a lot of um most of the communities and villages that exist now would not exist as they are without it um and it's also something that you know it's given us all so much opportunity whether that is you know through making money for college or um for us it's you know an inspiration for a business and um having the ability to share good food with other people and go to work every summer and harvest this like incredible incredible wild food um i can't imagine being at our family's dinner table talking about something other than salmon <laughs> it's, pretty <laughs> <rare>. <laughs> it's pretty rare i must say um so yeah i there are so many ways that it's defined us as people just the work itself and the environment and what it's given to us and um yeah it's oh. just like our our direct connection to our home just re like salmon has taught us like the respect of place and our home um just knowing like environment needs to be perfect for their return and oceans need to stay clean for them their life cycle there and um yeah just respect for all wild resources and then just how salmon it connects it all um yeah they do they do everything for us and we are just a pinprick in this time <laughs> like we gotta leave it a little better than we were given it and hopefully um the next generation will as well I see in your book too pictures of you guys foraging berries and I think I saw some algae, some seaweeds in, in your book too. And so this idea of wild food, um, uh, you know, and having that relationship to a place, you know, I guess what do you think people are missing when they don't have that? Cause most of the world doesn't have that anymore, uh, especially here, let's say in the United States and in Canada. So, and maybe you guys being in Alaska, I don't know how much that sort of, how how removed you are from that part of it i'm not really sure but like here where i live in maine i think people often imagine that maine is remote but it's like i you know it doesn't take me long to be at home depot or old mm -hmm. navy or something so it's uh so you know being connected to wild foods here it's almost like just almost like being part of like this secret society or something you you know something that other people don't know you have a relationship to the environment that you hear everybody talking about. Everybody's talking about the environment all the time. And you're like, have you been to the environment <laughs> before? Like, you know, um, and so I, for me, eating wild food and being made of it makes me, and I think we were sort of, you guys were sort of dancing around this topic a second ago. It's like, it makes, there's that stewardship thing suddenly becomes really real. Cause one, you have skin in the game in the sense that the foods that I love and care about and eat, I need these places to be intact and these species and their life cycle to be intact. Uh, but like I have a visceral, real connection to landscapes and other folks, a lot of times they're talking about that, but you're like, man, I really wish you, you could come out and actually be in these places and, and mm -hmm. make a little of yourself out of it. So yeah, like sort of, what do you think looking out at the world now where so few people, and you know, obviously when people buy salmon, a lot of times they, they buy it in a can, they buy it uh, farmed in the store. They, it's not, it's no longer the thing. They don't have that connection, even if they might eat the thing. So yeah. What do you think sort of, what do you think you have and have experienced in the people 
who do these kind of things experience that that you wish maybe the rest of the world could kind of get a piece of? Yeah, I mean, it comes back from being a human and humans are meant to be outside and live slowly and pay attention and seasonally, like just going back to our instincts, like hunting and gathering, gathering, especially like just that like wave of calm and wave of like being present and like the best way to live just comes from like wild harvest. And we've seen in our own ways of like, to lead a fulfilled life, a big part of it for us is to be so connected with the land around you and to pay attention um, and be a steward of that. Uh, and that, like, I think people are a little misled in a lot of ways by like wild food. They think it has to be this glamorous, like, fancy thing where like wild food can be the fiddleheads like growing outside your garage door <laughs> like it's like there's a, yeah, a lot of times they are <laughs> yeah, like, and you care and steward like you're a steward for that and you take great care of your property to allow like that's that's like right culvert for salmon habitat or just the little things like that makes a huge difference and just ownership and connection of what you can give back to the world is huge yeah Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And I, I also think, um, you know, one, one benefit is that it's free food. <laughs> <laughs> Most, some very delicious things come for free. Um, I think a lot of, like, in my experience, I think just like getting outside and being, as you said, in like this relationship with plants and animals around you does in a way make you feel um, you know, like, I don't know if I want to say like less al alone, alone, <laughs> but I think, um, just knowing that, you know, it's like, there's so much, so many living creatures out there that are in the world that can be like, you can have a relationship with and whether you're, you don't have to talk to them, but just noticing them, I think is, um, really special. And, you know, I think when you're like walking through the woods or you're on the beach looking for kelp or um it, it really allows you to slow down a little bit and see things differently i feel like um you open up your senses and your ears are actually listening maybe um you're seeing things that if you were you know t talking on the phone or you know whatever it is uh you don't always you're not tuned into and i love that about it um i think it gives you that connection to actually notice uh, yeah. what's in your home around you and yeah listen and feel and, and then, get outside which is the best yeah definitely once like you have that wild harvest like you connected to the like, places you traveled to obtain it and then like working with it in your kitchen and working with your people and that education of like future generations is a key to everything like humans want like in community and food and just lifestyle We've definitely seen like that aspect of learning from our mom about like different like edible plants and how you can um, like save them for winter or just that seasonality has been huge for like our personal development and our family as a whole, just our connection. I, I really like what you guys were, have been saying here. I really connect to it. There's this piece about loneliness that came up and I often liken it you know, if you come out of the urban environment, the built environment with with very little connection to nature, there's sort of like this thing of, it's like being in a new town where you don't know anybody if you go into nature. It's like, you don't know anybody. It's just this green stuff everywhere. It's like, who are these entities? You know, everything is potentially threatening and, and, and people are so concerned about things being poisonous, dangerous, bitey, stingy, poisonous in some way, venomous in some way. Um, and then as you get to know species, you start to like, oh, like I, this is a, it's like a town now where you know people. It's like, oh, I know that species. I know this species. And you start to feel at home, like part of that community of life. But then obviously as humans, um, with the compassion and the empathy and the emotional intelligence we have for other living creatures, I'm curious how you personally reconcile, I think all of us who, who hunt and fish, uh, and and gather too. We have to reconcile the predatory relationship with the love that we feel for these species. So, I think anybody listening here uh, can hear your passion and love for salmon. Uh, but for somebody who wonders, like, hey, how can you love this animal 
and then also be a predator of this animal. How do you guys sort of reconcile that? Or does that even ever come up for you? Because I think it's this complexity that a lot of folks who've been raised in the urban environment, they're confused about that. You know, yeah. it's like, um, and we see a, such a big push now um, for this idea of, hey, humans shouldn't eat anything that has to die for them to eat. And it's like, well, that's not going to be possible. So, so yeah, how do you reconcile that for yourselves? <laughs> it's all about respect, I think. Um, we obviously really respect salmon as an animal and a species. Um, and I've, it's kind of this idea of an honorable harvest. I mean, it's um, a life is a life is giving more life and um, just caring for that life and respecting it and also using it in a way that is um, like with a salmon, we use all of its parts and we make sure nothing goes to waste. Um, and it's, it's kind of just, um, yeah, I think there's, uh, I think there's just like this way to treat your food that, um, yeah, offering that life respect um, and knowing how much it, like what a gift it is that you've been given. To go off of what Emma's saying, it's like kind of, I don't know how to articulate this, but like maybe it's because we grew up doing it and seeing it or we're just so integrated with the landscape and the land, like everything, the work involved, but it kind of just taps into this like primal instinct of like harvest. And like, yeah, as you're saying, being a predator and it, it feels, it's like a natural feeling. Like you, it's hard to like justify it. It's like, this is what we were meant to do is like capture this. And then as Emma's saying, like respectfully, like honor it because it was so challenging to like achieve in that way. It took like everything we had and then be able to like honor it and share it. It like feels very natural, but with you, when you look at it at like a higher level, you're like, wait, you love and care about this so much. How can you kill it? It's just this like funny. Yeah hard yeah it's it's also like it's poignant and it's beautiful and it's like part of a human paradox but mm -hmm. i i agree because the fulfillment that you get there's a sense of like yes this is the right thing and i can love this animal and i can predate upon it and obviously when you predate upon something you don't want it to go away you have more that's what i find mm -hmm. interesting about it all this stuff is that i think like people who do extractive use on landscapes um for food you know, often care more about the landscape than people who, who have like a yeah. leave no trace ethic on the landscape. And that's just the thing that I think right now, culturally, people are struggling to understand and because there's such a hands off. I mean, cause obviously we can't send 7.8 billion people out on the landscape to forage right now. It's just not going to, that's not going to work. But those of us who get to, you know, we're pretty lucky, aren't we? <laughs> yeah, we're very lucky. And I think, you know, humans are just an animal in the food chain. We are at yeah. the top of the food chain and it's hard, I think, and that, that becomes kind of the difficult part where, um, you know, everything else is so connected where, like, if, I don't know, like, what can we give back? And, and that feels like the hard part, like, um, salmon might eat krill and the salmon might feed the trees and the tree benefits, but how are we benefiting anything? And that's the big question. And so I think that makes it hard to... Um, yeah, feel okay about taking another animal's life or, um, you know, harvesting from the wild, I think, and all we have to offer and can, like the most we can do is offer that respect and, um, I think honor those lives. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at a picture of where you guys grew up. And, uh, I mean, this photo, uh, you guys must by now understand how blessed and and like lucky you were to grow up on this is a picture of your home your family's homestead in this little bay here i think right and uh i mean you guys just grew up when people talk about living in nature growing up in nature i mean my goodness you guys are right on the water huh yeah we we're very fortunate but i think what it also taught us which has served well in like later life and running businesses doing all the different things is like mother nature is boss <laughs> like the <Yeah>. weather <laughs> yeah all and we are only human and so it's like another level of like yeah 
we growing up there taught us like we're s no expectation so fortunate for what we've got like yeah lucky to be involved in this landscape but this landscape will be here <laughs> yeah 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 it'll grind you right down to bones yeah, huh? <laughs> yep, that's fair. yeah yeah what do you guys see the future uh, or how do you feel about the future of salmon um, and what are the threats that concern you the most and are there some bright spots? I I recently read Mark Kurlansky's latest book, uh, Salmon. I don't know if you came across it. It's, you know, like a lot of the salmon books that have come out recently, they're a little unsettling, you know, mm -hmm. and I think M Mark's point um, is, I think if I could sort of paraphrase what he's trying to say is that uh, the future of the world and the future of salmon are pretty inextricably linked because the things yeah. that would allow salmon to carry on are the things that would allow the rest of the ecosystem to carry on. And and if we lose salmon, it would be sort of like because we're losing everything in a sense. Um, so do you think that that's too dire? You're right in it. Uh, or do you kind of agree? And then like, what do you see as the big threats? What do you see as the future? And are you hopeful or, or pessimistic about, you know, salmon into the next century? Yeah. No, he said it's perfect. Like, yes, 100%. Like, w the way we're moving and like the patterns, like, if we lose every, we lose salmon 100%. And so it's just like trying to do everything we can during our short lifetime to eliminate like the threats of mining and deforestation and just ruining habitat and to somehow give these fish a fighting chance and like a playing field to continue doing what they do best. Um, so I guess as like an optimistic person, of course I'm like, we're doing everything we can. Like we're stewards of this resource, like pristine habitat is the number one important thing. But at the same time, it's just so discouraging because as like you're saying, everything across the planet is just eroding slowly. Um, and so it's hard to like, how can we have this impact on like our one, one river system in Alaska and hope that this like resonates around the country and globe? Um, go ahead, Emma. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think one, you know, what we talk about a lot is at least in our own lives and like what we can do <laughs> um, is just make people feel uh, not that we can make them, but offer them a connection to feel close and part of this story of what they're part of and where they are in that place. And I think, you know, salmon have been like the, the gold thread that weaves us in and out of all these narratives and how do we, like offer people that connection to salmon. And so, you know, without, it's exactly as Mark said, you know, the salmon and the future of the world are linked and without salmon, I'm not sure, like, I'm just, yeah, exactly. It's hard to imagine <laughs> what the world looks like, at least on this end of the world. And so um, if we can make people feel more connected to that and to the things salmon need, I think there's, more of a chance for action on all of our parts and to do what we need to do. And so there's always hope. And I think Claire and I are pretty optimistic people. <laughs> so we're always thinking about, you know, the little wins and the big wins and um, the everyday uh, victories. And yeah, I think just onward. And I, um, you know, it's fun. It's just fun for us to go back to the ocean every summer and, just be part of something that's still thriving and um, yeah, bigger than us. feels good. I want to, I know you guys have been getting a lot of press and, and probably a lot of really good feedback uh, with your book and your projects. And so, you know, I'm going to just be another person saying something like this to you, but uh, you guys make me feel really optimistic. And I think part of it is seeing the changing face and changing nature of the commercial fishery because so much care is coming through in what you do. And then this idea of a brand that's sort of built around commercial fisheries isn't something I've really seen that much of before. The way you guys are doing it is really unique um, with the clothing line, with the book, but with you, you're actually doing the, the real work to yourselves, you know? So it's really interesting to see all that tied together and that sort of front-facing aspect to the commercial fishery because so often 
fisheries have been, I mean, I, I, I can't, I can't speak on behalf of commercial fisheries, but my, in my experience, a lot of times it's people who are pretty introverted, people who don't really want to have anything front facing. And so there's been like a disconnect a lot of times between the public and what goes on in the fishery. So we, I, what you guys are doing makes me feel really optimistic. I really appreciate the way you're opening it up to the public to see what you're doing and then to be really all these things that feed back into what looks like not just the conservation piece, but also the community piece. So I was wondering if you guys could say a couple things about what's the future for Salmon Sisters um, and also what are some of the things you guys contribute to your community? Because I see that you giving back to your community is really important to you. And uh, and again, I just want to say bravo and well done because I think you're doing something really unique and special and something I hope m- we start to see more of. Oh, Daniel, thank you. That's so kind. That's so kind. That's so kind you. Um, it looks like yeah, a lot of it looks like a lot of work to do what you're doing. I mean, well, honestly, because I know what it is to run a business. You mm-hmm. just speaking to us like that story of Sam and Sisters. We're like, ah, he understands. This is incredible. Like, yes. <laughs> so so um, but no, Sam and Sisters is a continuation of like what we are doing as you said like we are we are commercial fishermen first and foremost and this world will take us where this business will go um and we are so thankful for the opportunity to like share what the values and work on the water and everything like this resource has afforded the commercial sector and how we can help people like understand that connection between like harvest and food um and respect there and then like, as you said, like our community drives everything. Like we, they keep us going. Like being able to help them problem solve and get them like, resources they want and just like inspiration and under, like help them realize they're part of something bigger and it's really special and important and people look up to them and they're stewards of this incredible thing is like all we can do with this business. Um, and we're very fortunate we get to work together on something. We have different talents and it works well together. Um, and then just like staying, living and working on the water and with food in Alaska is the number one priority. So that interest will drive what we do with Salmon Sisters or how it evolves through the years. Um, and definitely realizing like people are really interested in this time with that connection to their place and their food, like we can continue to help educate them and give them like the tools they need to just have a like that personal connection in their own lives um but i guess the last thing i have is we yeah as you said saw that like how can we help people understand like what commercial fishermen are doing and their importance in this whole world um and we've, we've been able to work with our seafood processor to donate like wild Alaska salmon to the food bank of Alaska. So just getting that like super food that commercial fishermen are lucky to be able to catch to those who are most in need. Um, and that's been the most rewarding thing we've been able to accomplish mm-hmm. with our business and just inspire others to donate um, product time or find their own little ways with any small business to give back. When I was growing up, going to the food bank was like you got this like gnarly Velveeta cheese type stuff, and yeah. this, you know, shoebox size block. The idea, the idea of going and getting wild, wild Alaskan salmon is like, I just Wait. that's a pretty cool concept. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you know, and yeah. food that really nourishes you too. I mean, I think that's a big part of it. Is is a lot of times, you know, like I said, growing up pretty poor, the food that we had access to wasn't the food that really you build a great body out of. You know, that you build mm-hmm. a great brain out of. And so it's just really cool that you're able able to do that. Mm-hmm. Tell us about, uh, well, I want to just make sure we talk a little bit about the brand and how people find your stuff and, uh, and about some of the designs and things that are on your website uh, for the ladies listening or for the dudes out there who can fit into those uh, gar- <laughs> garment cuts. Because <laughs> you guys yep. have a lot, of really, a lot of really cool stuff there. Very cool stuff. Oh, yeah. Yep. Well, if people are on the internet, you can find us at aksalmonsisters.com. Um, you can find gear and also wild fish there from Alaska. And you can find us on Instagram and Facebook at AK Salmon Sisters. 
Um, and we're on, we're on there a lot. We have a blog up that tells stories and we have a newsletter that we send out. Um, Cause that doesn't take up any time. I, I, no. <laughs> like, how are you, how are you have a commercial fishing gig and then you no. do all of that? I mean, it's so much like keeping up. With free flowing. Keeping up with the blog. <laughs> yeah. We fit it in when we can, but it, yeah, it's, it's a very natural fit for us to work. You know, it's, as you said, we're, living the life and then when we have some downtime it's pretty easy to tell the story so yeah we're very lucky that our work our world of work all gets to fit together so nicely with family and fishing and eating good food so yeah yeah. um yeah and our cookbook is full of delicious recipes from our family and a lot of they're really simple easy and um i think you know a good a good place to start if you're not used to cooking fish at home and um you can find some salmon on our website too and easy to grill easy to throw on the grill or cook in the oven or just um eat you know cut up and make a poke or some sushi (laughs) or something (laughs) like that yeah and even Mm -hmm. if you're not looking for you know necessarily dedicated recipes i think the book is just a great read anyway it's really it's just full of a lot of like interesting stuff and uh, fun stuff for people who want to know a little bit more about that world out there so uh just great job is there anything that uh while we have some time left is there anything either of you uh maybe didn't get to say that you'd like to say no just thank you for taking the time to talk to us it's such a nice such a nice opportunity especially talk about our summer and the book and all things salmon sisters it's great yeah wishing you the best and all of maine too yeah yeah (laughs) thank you (laughs) yeah thank you so much daniel this is great well i just think you guys are doing really um really really valuable work in the world and really honest work and uh you come through with such a clean energy that it's it's apparent that you guys are walking out the kind of i don't know something that inspires goodness in people and so that's i think we need so much of that in the world and so you guys are great inspirations for that so thank you so much and thank you for your time today thanks for listening to the wild fed podcast you can help us grow the show by subscribing and leaving us a rating and review it ensures better rankings and more advertiser interest which translates directly into better shows more awesome guests and a constant stream of fresh new content. Have a question you'd like answered on the show or a hunting, fishing, or foraging trip you'd like to host us on? Email us at info at wild-fed.com. And be sure to visit our website, wild-fed.com, to check out the Wild Fed video show and store. Wild Fed. Food is all around you.